Hey everybody, Twin Dad here, and welcome back to Magium, Book Two, Chapter Four. Um, before we actually start reading anything, a little update there. The last time I actually posted a video, I think it's been like a million years ago, but I ha now have a third child, and she is nine months old. So I originally made the name for the YouTube there. Um, I put Twin Dad and Company. And that's exactly the reason why, in case I had more children. And I just happened to have another one. So, uh, yeah. And I've been on a, I guess, hiatus for like almost two years. And it's been interesting, I guess. But I'm glad to be back. And I'd like to be able to at least post something once a week. But we'll see how that goes. I'm not going to try and stress out and post something once a day like I was before. And, yeah, it's... Anyway. Time for a new stress-free YouTube. We'll see how that goes. Um, I actually had to watch one of my last videos I posted of Chapter 3, the ending, because I could not remember for the life of me what was going on. And I actually have not read any... I, was, I started reading on my phone, I think, last week to try and like catch up, but I, I, I said uh, it doesn't matter. So I actually watched the last couple minutes of my last video because I didn't have a clue what was going on. I couldn't even remember the people's names besides Barry. But we'll continue on how it goes. And I'm not going to make two hour long videos. I'm going to try to keep it to like 20 or 30 minutes. Because nobody wants to hear me ramble on like that. And the only one that has to put up with that is my wife. So uh, anyway, let's continue off from where we went. And I can't even remember how many skill points I have. The trapdoor above us opens up, allowing the platform to slowly lift us through the thick layer of rock making up the cave ceiling. Once we get close to the height level of our division cells, a second trapdoor opens up, and the platform slows down to a halt. And we, As we finally reach our destination, almost immediately after it stops, the elevator changes its course and it starts to descend back towards the lower levels. We jump off the platform and onto the cell's floor, while the trans oh, transport... <laughs> While the trapdoor closed itself back up, blocking the elevator from our view. Whoa, what's going on? We hear a voice coming from behind us. How did you get here? And how in the God's name did you get so bloody wet? As both uh, Leila and I turn around, we quickly realize that the elevator did not in fact lead us back to Leila's room. Instead, it led us to a cell number three, which is one of the rooms that the desk worker offered me to choose from when I first got here. And also the room that is currently being inhabited by the mage who locked up, who got locked up in the place yesterday. The mage is looking at us with a somewhat frightened look, while a trickle of sweat is running down his forehead, and he appears to be hiding something behind his back. Sorry to bother you, I tell the mage. We went out for a swim, and we got lost on our way back. We'll be out of your hair as soon as you unlock the door for us. Out for a swim, the mage asks, shocked. You were trying to escape, weren't you? Give me one good reason why I should call the guards right now and tell them what you were doing. Uh, actually, before I choose an option there, also my webcam base broke. And I couldn't really get it to work unless I like literally duct taped it to my monitor. So I actually ordered another one. It'll be in, well, with all this virus shenanigans going on, it saying anywhere from June 9th to June 30th. So we'll see when it comes in. Um... Not that you want to see me anyway. <laughs> uh, if you let us go, I won't ask anything about that thing you were hiding behind your back. Go ahead. The air arena's owner already knows what what's happening. I honestly can't remember if he does or not. Okay. Um, you don't even know what it is behind his back. Be I'll bluff. I, I might be a bluff. Go ahead, the arena's owner already knows what's happened. You're lying, the mage says. I bet you don't even know what the owner looks like. It's not going to work, Lula writes. We're looking directly at his ma at the mage. Oh, yeah, she types above her head or something. What's with the writing, the mage asks, confused, while looking at Layla. Is this how you talk? What's not, what's not going to work? Layla reaches for the floor in order to pick up an object that looks like it was made by gluing several pieces of scrap metal together in the most random ways possible. The item is small enough to fit in her palm, so she grabs it with one hand and she stretches her arm towards the mage, bringing the metal object several inches away from his face. This, 
Leela writes, this is what not's go this is what's not going to work. I don't know what you're talking about, the mage says, feigning ignorance. That's just a piece of scrap metal. No, Leela writes, this is a device that's meant to enhance your physical abilities for a limited amount of time. And that thing you are hiding behind your back is likely meant to act as a bridge between you and your scrap metal device, allowing you to transfer your magical energy into it for over your, over a period of time. How did you, the mage starts to say, but he stops when he sees a new text appear in front of him. You can't use this device in the arena, Leela writes. It will be detected immediately. If you don't get it somehow... If you don't get it to somehow link itself directly to your magical aura, the magical energy that will burst from the device when you activate it will trigger all the magical detectors in a five mile radius. Yes, sir. Either way, even if you do somehow get it to work, the device is so poorly made that you won't be able to use it for more than a few minutes, even if you spend the whole day charging it. A few minutes is more than enough in an arena. The mage shouts, a few minutes can mean the difference between life and death. You don't know how terrifying an arena can be. You have no idea. Even if I can get even the slightest advantage out of the device, I, then I will use it gladly. Wow, he seems rather desperate. Don't say I didn't warn you, Layla writes, and she hands the mage his scrap metal device. The mage takes the device and he looks it, at it for a few seconds with a contemplative expression on his face. He then pulls out a key from his pocket and he walks past us to unlock and then open the door. This meeting never took place, the mage says, as he looks towards each of us in turn. As he looks towards each of us in turn. Do you understand? Now go on, get out of here. You don't need to tell us twice, I say, as I head out the door and leave the room together with Layla. As the mage closes behind the door, the door behind us the two of us start to head towards our rooms i'm surprised that you could tell what the device was meant for just from one glance i say i used to spend a lot of time in my father's workshop back when we were living in our forest cabin leela writes i learned a thing or two while watching him work do you think he'll be able to modify the device in time for the arena i ask her it's possible leela writes but he'll need to do it fast he won't be able to charge it with energy while he's tinkering with it and he'll need to charge it for at least 10 hours to get any decent use out of it, given how inefficient it is. We should go get changed, I say. I also want to take a look through my notebook to see if I can find any useful information on the creatures we've seen in the caverns. I'll see you in a few hours to tell you what I found. Leela nods. See you later, Leela writes, and she heads towards her room. I go back to my room as well, and the first thing I do... After I enter is search my backpack for a dry shirt and a new pair of pants. I wonder why. Once I get changed and leave my white clothes to dry, I pick up my notebook and get back to studying. About one hour after I started reading, I got a call on my transceiver from Flower. Barry, are you okay? Flower asked me out of the blue. With a bit of panic in her voice, I could immediately tell that it was her and not Eluna speaking from the tone of her voice. Yes, I'm alive, I say. We managed to get back to ourselves about an hour ago. Thank the gods, Flower says. When I heard about what happened, I got really worried. Especially when I found out that you got left alone with that jerk firing. Petal's been worried sick, too. Oh, I ask her, surprised. Did she say that? Well, technically, Flower says. When she said... What she said was that if you couldn't handle yourself in a situation like that after joining this tournament, then you deserve your fate. But I'm sure that's not what she really meant. <laughs> yeah. Whoops, whoopsie. Stop it. Oh boy, what'd I do? I didn't click it. I swear. Uh, crap. Hold on. I'll be right back. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -da. Okay, there we go. Well, technically, Flower says blah blah blah. I know I didn't click the mouse button. I'm sure you remember. Me. Oh yeah. Well, you tell her that her blue eyes make her look fat. Wow. It's okay. I know she means well. What about Araka? Was she not worried about me? Yeah. I think that's the one I accidentally clicked anyway. What about Araka? Was she not worried about me? Of course I was worried, Araka says. I'm worried about you all the time. I keep praying every day that somehow 
We'll finally find a cure for your morbid stupidity. <laughs> and I've had no luck so far. Don't be discouraged, though. I'm sure that someone will eventually put you out of your misery. Thank you for your kind words, I tell her. Whoops. Whoops, don't do it again. What did you, oh, what did I do last time? Oh, yes, I used my mouse pad. Um, left mouse button because this just scroll actually makes it go right crazy. All right. Thank you for your kind words. Hey, no problem, Araka says. Also, would you mind telling me how in the hell you managed to convince the troll to let you go? I thought for sure you were done for when I sensed him coming coming near you. You mean Valgos, I ask her? The troll that wouldn't die even if you cut off his head? He got stopped by the arena's owner. Apparently he wants to make a show of our fight. And we'll be fighting the troll in the second round of the arena instead. Ha, Araka says. I'll be looking forward to it. Be careful, Barry, Flower says. We won't be able to help you while you're in the arena. Yeah, I know, I say. Don't worry, I'll be fine, but thanks for your concern. After I got done talking to Flower and Aluna, I spent another hour studying my notebook. And then I started calling my friends from the other divisions, one by one. In order to tell them my findings. When I got to Kate, I also decided to tell her about an old inmate from the Beacon to see how she'd react. Hey, Kate, I say, do you remember having met a young Lesathai girl with silver hair who couldn't talk back when you were at the Beacon of Hope? Or maybe she had black hair back then. I'm not sure. There's a brief pause after I finish my phrase, during which I couldn't even hear a sound of Kate's breathing. How do you know about Layla? Kate asked me after a few seconds. So you do remember her, I say. Were the two of you on good terms, or tell me how you know about her, Kate shouts. Okay, okay, I say. I met her the other day. She is a member of my division. She's still alive. There's another brief pause during which Kate doesn't say anything. You're certain of this, Kate says? How do you know it's really her? She might be trying to trick you. Anyone can dye their hair white and pretend that they're not able to speak. The Layla I know should have been dead for a long time. Well, apparently you're wrong. Why, I say, did you find her body? No, Kate says, I did not. Well then, I say, I guess it's, I guess it wouldn't hurt you to meet her, would it? You'll be able to tell her for yourself if it's really her when you see her up close. All right, Barry, I'll agree to meet her, but be careful around her. You can't know for sure that it's really her. There are a lot of Lesathai in that institution who knew about us. The information could have gotten out in any number of ways. Fine, I'll be careful. I'll see you at the arena tomorrow. Don't be late. See you tomorrow. Simply. And then we both close the transmission. Once I make sure that every one of my friends knows about the monsters from the arena and their weaknesses, I decide that it's time to get back to Layla in order to finally formulate a plan for how to deal with tomorrow's events. When I reach her room, I knock three times and she opens the door. Dressed in the same clothes that she was wearing when we got back from the caverns. Her clothes is not as wet as they were when we returned, but they are definitely nowhere near dry yet. You didn't get changed? I ask, shocked. I don't have any change of clothes, Lily writes. I wasn't carrying a backpack with me when I got captured. Well, why didn't you say something, I say. You could have asked me for some spare clothes until you dried up. I didn't want to be a bother, Lily writes. Wait a minute, I say. If you don't have a backpack with you, then what about food? Don't tell me that you haven't eaten anything since you came here. The guards have provided me with a minimum supply of food and water, Leela writes. Just enough to get by. It's not a problem. Of course it's a problem, I say. Wait here. I'm going to bring you a change of clothes and some food. No, you don't have to, Leela starts to write, but I ignore her. I go back to my room and search for some clothes and, and beef jerky for my backpack. I then come back to Layla and hand her a long sleeve shirt, a pair of pants, the jerky, and a bottle of water. Here you go. I tell Layla, now hurry up and get changed, will you? You wouldn't want to catch a cold right before the arena. Thank you, Layla writes. And she takes what I've given her and then closes the door in order to get changed. Continue. She opens the door a bit later, dressed in my clothes, with the long sleeve shirt hanging past her hands and the pants trailing on the ground behind her. Barry must be tall. These clothes are a little big for me, Layla writes. You look fine, I tell her. It's not like you'll be fighting in these clothes at the arena event. It's just until you own... <laughs> it's just until your own clothes dry off. 
Come on, let's go inside. I want to tell you what I found while reading my notebook. We both enter her room, and I spend the next 15 minutes telling her the most important parts of my findings. She listens closely to what I have to say, while taking a bite from the beef jerky I gave her every so often. After I'm done talking, she puts the beef jerky on the bed and beside her, and she starts to write. From what you're telling me, Leela writes, I understand that our biggest problem by far will be the troll, and is higher than average regeneration. Yeah, I tell her. It's already known that a troll can regenerate fast enough to not die from a wound to the heart, but a troll being able to survive with its head cut off is something that I didn't think was possible. I guess it goes to show how little we really know about regeneration in general. According to all the books I've read, any living being that has a head severed from its body should not be able to live any longer, regardless of how high its regeneration is. The fact that the body could even regenerate its head contradicts our most basic knowledge of, about how a troll's body is supposed to work. But the troll didn't regenerate its head, Leela writes. The head kept talking from the ground, and the body had to pick up, pick it back up. Oh, that's pretty interesting. You're right, I say. That means the link between the body and its head is somehow not broken, even after the two of them get separated. Maybe we can use this. If the troll is still using its head to see and hear, even after it's been severed from the body, then maybe we can cut, off, cut his head off, pick it up, and then blindfold it or something, leaving his body defenseless. I don't think that the troll would leave himself open like that again in the arena. Lula writes, I used the element of surprise before, but now he knows how fast I am, and he won't let me cut his head off again so easily. Well, the only way you can kill a regular troll, I say, is either by cutting off his head or, or by burying it alive. If cutting the head off is not an option, then the only alternative we have left is fire. That being said, getting access to any sort of flames will be next to impossible in the arena, and that the troll is even wearing anti-magic armor, which gives him protection to fire. Even if we somehow manage to find a way to burn him, we'd first have to damage his armor badly enough that the magical protections on it would wear off. Do you think we should talk about all this with the other members of our division, Leela writes? Maybe they could come up with some ideas. Hmm. <laughs> I've spent my whole time making friends, I guess. Uh, I'm going to try this one. I suppose it couldn't hurt to hear their options. On the matter, Leela nods. All right, then, I say. Let's go knock on their doors, and we'll have a meet-up in the recreation room. I turn to leave the room, but Leela grabs me by the sleeve, and she stops me in my tracks. As I turn back towards her, I see that the blue writing in front of her simply says simply, wait. The blue writing then quickly disappears, being replaced by a new text. Can we do this later, Leela writes? Later, I ask her, confused. After my clothes have dried, Leela writes, with a pleading look in her eyes, as she shows me the long sleeves hanging from her wrists. Oh, right, right, I say. Sorry, I forgot. I pause for a few seconds. I, On a second thought, I say, maybe we should have this discussion tomorrow, during our final recreation period. The area events won't start until the day after tomorrow, so we'll have plenty of time to make a strategy... I don't really feel like knocking on everyone's doors as if I were trying to distribute a bunch of pamphlets. Plus, some of them might not agree to a meeting, even if I call them. I think they'll be more inclined to hear me out tomorrow when we're all in the same room. Leela nods again. I think I'm going to return to my room and try to dig up some more information, I say. I'll search for every note that I've written regarding regeneration, and I'll try to see if I can make some sense of the situation. Maybe if we properly understand the troll's ability, we can find a way to counter it. Let me know if you come up with any ideas in the meantime. I will, Leela writes. Well then, I guess I'm off, I say. I'll see you again later. See you later, Leela writes, and then I leave her room and go back to my own. As I close the door behind, to my room behind me, and I pick up my notebook once again, my thoughts race towards the left side, Lesathai, who offered me the deal with the king. I still haven't told any of my friends about it. Should I tell them about it? 
I don't know, should you? All right. Yes, sir. All right. No, I shouldn't make them worry needlessly. If I'm going to tell them of this, then I'll be after the arena when everyone will be safe. As I am, as I am lost in thought, while mechanically turning the pages of my notebook one by one, my eyes chance upon a paragraph that I seem to have skipped the last few times I was skimming through these texts. The paragraph mentions a theory that is not very popular among scholars, which states that the high regeneration of some creatures may be a result of innate difference between their auras and ours. I, similar, <clears throat> I suddenly remember Eden's lecture before we entered the city when he was telling me that if you mess, if you mess enough with a person's aura, you can even stop them from aging. If what he told me is true, then it wouldn't be far off the stretch to assume that a special type of aura could grant someone a high regeneration rate. If that is the case, then could this aura perhaps also keep the perhaps also keep in okay. Perhaps also help in keeping the limbs functional even if they are severed from the body. I'll admit that my knowledge about auras is limited, but from the little I know, a person's aura is not supposed to have unlimited range. If that were to happen, then, if the troll's head would be taken too far away from the body after it's been cut off, would his consciousness fade away? Would that make him die for good? If we ever manage to cut that troll's head off again, this is definitely something that's worth testing out. I ended up spending the day trying to look for more information to confirm my theory. Unfortunately, not a lot of research has been done on the subject. Since most people can barely even read the level of magic power in someone's aura, so the theory that an aura could influence a body's regeneration has been deemed as not grounded in facts by the by most respectable groups of scholars. And the few who have wanted to pursue this theory did not receive the appropriate funding to do so. I spent my whole day researching this, and all I have to show for it is an outlandish theory based on another outlandish theory whose validity, validity, validity hinges mostly on one of Eden's offhanded remarks. Better than nothing, I guess. I put my notebook back in my backpack, and I prepare to go to sleep. I'll have more time to study tomorrow. Um, that is a good place to end it right there. I'll continue on from this area right here. I won't hit continue. Um, it seems pretty interesting. We were down the cavern, which I remember now. Uh, I talked about Eden, and then it talked about my friends and all that uh, fun stuff. And hopefully it'll actually get to the actual battle tomorrow or the next episode or whatever. But uh, we'll see when all that comes in the next episode of Magium, which would be chapter 4, continued. Alright, uh, thank you everybody for watching, and I will see you next time.